it's when the Roman Empire fell, when the Western Roman Empire fell, people still use its currency for hundreds of years. And, yeah, you're right. So, you know, right? So, yeah, I think like like the dollar is the amazing product if you think about it. It's like it's accepted almost everywhere. You know, it's very stable. So, uh, and like especially with like U like USD stable coins, it's like highly portable. You know, like very easy to transfer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mutual Knowledge. I am Gauthier Lamotte, your host, and today my guest is Mao Mao Ho. Hi, Mao Mao, how are you? Hi, Gauthier, how are you doing? Good. So, how should we introduce you to our audience? Uh, well, um, so I currently lead engineering, and I'm also the chief operating officer at ZeroCap, so we're an Australian, uh, primarily Australian OTC desk. Um, previously... Uh, I guess I'll just go into my background a little bit. So I started my career mostly working in AI. So I started my career as a management consultant. Um, and then we're, so uh, by great coincidence and great fortune, I was given the responsibility of building an AI practice at my consulting firm, which had about a thousand people in North America, uh, like right out of college. So I didn't really know anything about uh, financial services or consulting. I know, only knew a little bit about AI, but by and large, I think it was um, a worthwhile experience for myself and the firm. You know, I think we we're able to generate some revenue and certainly a lot of um, a really great thought leadership for the firm. And so, yeah, so I worked uh, as a worked in AI for financial services as a management consultant for a while, and then left, um, and then joined a startup using. AI to detect market manipulation. Uh, so worked there for a little bit, uh, which was eventually, it was called Norensic. It was eventually acquired by TT after I'd left. And then left that to uh, basically co-found a startup with a friend of mine, which was making uh, like middle office solutions for prime brokers and hedge funds. And so I was working in AI, you know, more or less all this time. But then, you know, haven't been in AI for a while. Uh, I kind of, realize that like like ai is it's a lot more specialized than people think you know it's um it's really like the way i like i call to me ai is really the intersection or the combination of math and philosophy and so it's a it's like uh and and all right so and then mathematicians are in my view like much more similar to professional athletes than people might think so it really is a young man's or young person's sport. And you know, like, there's a reason the Fields Medal is only given to people on under 30. And like most of the big discoveries are between like 20 and 30. And so where I'm going with this is like, when I did my bachelor's, it wasn't in mathematics. And it's like, by the time I'd start working in AI, like I was able to learn, but I realized how far behind I was compared to a lot of the groundworking, groundbreaking stuff that's being done. So I was like, in 2017, I was like, either I go get my PhD or I stop working in AI. Like that was kind of the, the fork in the road that I was facing. And so I made the decision to not get my PhD uh, and take the safe path, which was going into crypto instead. Because in crypto, having been in financial services for a little bit, uh, obviously like the market was less sophisticated than it was now in 2017. So I had a, a massive competitive advantage personally, because I had worked in banks and had worked in financial services and knew how these things like knew how these things worked, but also knew why they worked. And so, uh, yeah, so so I um, went into crypto, started a company with another friend of mine doing payments from the United States, Nigeria, which was, uh, was, was a failure while I was there. You know, he built a product using a blockchain to send payments and really didn't achieve what he wanted to achieve. But another like really great learning experience for myself and then uh, in 2018, I moved to China, and I was there for about a year and a half, uh, working with some other friends, um, running a uh, crypto high frequency trading firm. So did that for a little bit, and then uh, while I was uh, working around Asia, I met uh, some of the principals at ZeroCap, and then in um, at 2020, they asked us to build their wealth management platform, which we did. And then uh, 2020, 2021, price of Bitcoin went up and uh, the platform grew very quickly. And so today I lead engineering for zero cap and I'm also the chief, the interim chief operating officer. And uh, so, yeah, that's how I, so I got here. 
Interesting. So uh, before we, we talk about zero cap, what's the um, landscape like in China regarding crypto? Of course, regarding AI, China is a top-notch country, obviously. But uh, regarding crypto, how is it going? Well, first of all, I dispute the claim that AI, uh, China is a top-notch AI company. Ah, AI please country. do. Okay, yeah, so please I really dispute don't think that. That's true at all. But um, like, if you like, if you read the papers coming out of okay, so I'll, I'll answer your question in of a course. second. But I just want to talk about this other thing because it's, it's very important to me. Like, uh, so my parents are both professors, and uh, at the USCC, which is like, it's what it's like the MIT of China. It's like tech. It's a tech university, research university in China, and so I know like exactly how the academic and research landscape works in China, and so. In China, like, like in the United States, you know, or most places, whether or not you get tenure or whether or not you get promoted is often based on the, like, how influential your papers are. So, like, you look at a guy like Cloud Shannon, like, he wrote one, basically, like, one paper, and that was, like, his calling card for the rest of his life. That's fine. Like, that's how it should work, I think. Um, in China, your career advancement is based on the number of papers that you publish, mm. which is a completely different incentive structure. And so what happens in China is... Like everyone's just like pumping out papers as quickly as possible or like spinning up new journals as quickly as possible to publish papers as quickly as possible. And what also happens is like, so you have like the department head and they're like, they have, you know, associate professors and associate professors have graduate students. So the graduate students write the paper and then everyone else puts their name on it. So everyone's just like pumping out papers and most of these papers are not even involved in. And so if you like, there's a statistic that like China has the most research papers and most patents. Yeah, but this uh, explains AI, that. Okay. But they're garbage, you know. And so if you look at the most influential papers, basically every year, and none of them are Chinese. If you just pick like some of the papers off archive, uh, like most of the times, just like we read this paper from the United States and made a model that was twenty times bigger, so our results are five cent better. It's like okay, no shit, you know. Like that's not really contributing anything. You know, good job. Uh, technically, it is state of art, but you know, we all know that's not really true. And um, not not like even if those results are are reproducible, which often they aren't. So yeah, no, I I think that like like I'm not saying Chinese people are dumb, you know, like um, but I am saying that the incentive structure for research is absolutely broken. And uh, okay. so yeah, I don't think there's a lot of like really novel research coming out of China. So allow me to express my gratitude and dear listeners, this is exactly why I'm doing these podcasts to have my beliefs broken and crushed and uh, not in the bad way. I love when you know you have. You have uh, preconceived ideas and an expert basically tells you, oh, actually, it's not that simple. Thank you so much for that. And, you know, it's interesting because in France, we have a bit of a mix between the two because academic papers, usually when you're passing your PhD in France, uh, academic papers are strongly encouraged to reference other studies just because your credibility, your popularity rises if there are more quotes uh, leading to your own page, just uh, just as if we were doing SEO on Google. So the more people refer to your papers, even though the paper is irrelevant to what you are saying, uh, the more uh, the, the better your reputation will be. So in France, uh, when there's um, a professor supervising a PhD thesis, he or she will always say, "You should quote my study as well. You should quote the papers I've done in order to, <laughs> you know, do that." So it's interesting because I, I didn't know that the incentive system was like that in China. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, are these papers uh, accessible for, from the US or are they, uh, are they mostly in Mandarin? I uh, know. I mean, I think most papers that get published are uh, like a lot of like a lot of stuff's just on archive. You know, okay. so. Yeah, like you can. I'm number one. Most of it is is in English. Number two, even if it wasn't, I mean, it's it's just computer science, right? So the pseudo code is going to be in English. You know, if there's any code, it's going to be in English or like code, right? So, yeah. So it's like it's fairly fairly straightforward, I think. So it's, it's quite easy to uh, to to see that. Okay, very interesting. And so, how's the blockchain landscape then? Yeah. So I mean, I've been out of China. So when COVID hit. We left China pretty much immediately and moved to Fiji, which was a terrific decision. And now I'm <laughs> back in the United States. So I haven't been in China since like 2020. Um, yeah, and a lot happens in four years. A lot, especially uh, after COVID, right? I But imagine. I mean, when I was there in 2019, I would say China and Asia was most definitely the epicenter of the crypto world. Maybe not the blockchain world, but definitely like 
in a sense of like there was more experimentation, there were faster product cycles, there were more users, there was more order volume going through Asia than anywhere else. Like more mining, like uh, OKX, Huobi, Binance, these are all Chinese exchanges, let's be honest with us. So and so that was true in 2019. I would say in terms of like blockchain research, you know, like San Francisco, Berlin to a certain degree, um, you know, Denver, um, New York, these places I think had a lot more going on in terms of the conceptual work, mostly Bay Area. Um, but no, in terms of money and business, it was definitely Asia. Um, so like China, you know, uh, Japan to a certain degree, uh, Tokyo, Sing uh, sorry, um, Hong Kong, Singapore. That being said, in, in the years, like when I was there, already there was like uh, an increasing crackdown on crypto. And because, you know, China is also notorious for having some of the toughest currency controls in the world, which is why I find the talk about like CNY being reserve currency absurd. You know, like you can't be a reserve currency and then not let people use your currency. You know, you have to be free floating. But um, and so that has only accelerated after COVID. And after the economic situation in China has got worse. And so, yeah, like um, it's very challenging, I think, to be a crypto company in China, which I think is another, you know, massive mistake because China was was the leader, you know, um, and there was a lot of innovation going on um, and just, you know, raw revenue and jobs being generated. Uh, but to be fair, there are also a lot of scams you know, that kind of comes with the territory. And so... Like in this day and age, the truth is, like a lot of crypto activity is is still initiated by um, ethnic Chinese people. They're just you know doing it out of companies that are domiciled in Hong Kong or Singapore, or you know like the Philippines, and they have offshore teams that are working out these locations, but might be like coming back to like an onshore team of developers doing some of the grunt work or like marketing or ops people somewhere in China because labor is still relatively cheap there. So, so the, the landscape has shifted. It's kind of moved out of the mainland a little bit. There's still a lot of money there. Um, but the fact that like the, the regulatory environment is just so hostile there, that's definitely shifting out, not necessarily to Hong Kong, but to like, you know, just, uh, I guess Singapore is probably the biggest beneficiary in this regard. Um, and, you know, on the flip side, like the, the regulatory environment in the United States is finally warming up with the Bitcoin ETF and all these things. So I think we're, we are going to see a bigger shift from east to west in crypto, uh, but it's just starting right now. Fascinating. So, yeah, but, but that's understandable at the same time. How would, uh, well, the Chinese government uh, is really will, um, willing to stay centralized in many ways. So how would they be uh, advocating a very decentralized system at the same time, of course? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, yeah. that's, would, that would be paradoxical. And so then what are you guys doing at ZeroCap? Yeah, well, you know, we're an OTC desk. We primarily service hedge funds, family offices, uh, other OTC desks, uh, payments companies, uh, import exporters. Um, about half our volume is out of Australia. Um, we're, our biggest equity investor is VSG, which is the largest family office in Australia. So we have a pretty big footprint in the family office space just around the world. And um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's what we do. In like recently, we've been making a big shift into um, targeting, I guess, a more sophisticated, more sophisticated, a more actively trading client base is what I'd say. So we're onboarding API clients, which is not something we've done before. We're building the payment widget, which we've talked about to allow people to like, we're working with this ATM company where like the minimum order size could be as low as $20 Aussie, whereas previously our minimum order size was $50,000. Hmm. So, um, yeah, so we're making a big shift towards being tech, more tech enabled, but I mean, it's just, it's just selling liquidity. You know, it's uh, it's it's pretty common in this space. Interesting, and uh, would you care explaining for our listeners what you mean by OTC? Because so some of yeah. them might not know that. Well, OTC is just a fancy acronym for a trade between two people directly. So, like technically, if we show up in a coffee shop. And I give you like a hundred dollars, like a like a dollar bill, and then you send me a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. Well, that's an OTC transaction between the two of us. So uh, in practice, OTC is usually used when you like you want to be private, so you don't want to go on the exchange, uh, or you don't trust the exchange. Like you like we're, we're we're regulated in Australia, so like there's plenty of people who would prefer to do business with us than go on like a unregulated crypto exchange. 
um, it's generally used for larger ticket transactions. So, and this is true in, in equities as well, is like, if you go on the exchange, you'll see there are like, there are a lot of small orders and there are some bigger orders and you kind of kind of work the book to kind of like, if you want to buy like $10 million worth of Bitcoin, it t it's going to take a while, even on some uh, place like Binance. Of course. Whereas if you go to us, it's just like, you know, it just happens immediately. And we just give you a price, and you just hit it. So, um, so yeah, we tend to service, um, we don't really service retail. We tend to service like, we do larger ticket sizes. We tend to service like larger organizations. Um, and again, this is how it works in equities as well. You know, like if you're, if you're like a pension fund in the United States, you're not going to go to NASDAQ and start buying shares. You're going to go to Goldman Sachs. You're going to go to Morgan Stanley and it, like hit a dark pool like bats. And you're going like, to kind of go around and, and when everything fails, then maybe you go to NASDAQ. So it's just the same market structure that's kind of growing up in crypto as well. Fascinating. Fascinating. And so uh, how do you envision the future for uh, for both individuals but also small businesses high you know high-end businesses we know what's going to happen basically they have the firepower power so they can adapt to any new technology but there are many um many small business owners who would benefit from the crypto industry uh, how would that solution help the those business owners for example i'm talking small freelancers up to you know 150 people um uh, companies with 150 employees, so not a huge company, but still something where you have quite a workload to manage. How would these guys fare um, thanks to the crypto industry and thanks to solutions such as uh, as the ones you guys at, at Zero Cap are proposing? Yeah, well, I think it really depends on, like, like you mentioned, the scale of the organization, but also where they're located geographically. Obviously. Because... You know, if you're like a small business in the United States and you have basically unlimited access to dollars, then you kind of don't really you don't really need crypto like dollar like the payment system in America is fine. It's a little bit slow, but it's fine. You know, it's fairly cheap. It's like there's easy to get access to. Um, whereas if you're in Argentina or like you're in China, you're in uh, like when we were in 2017, we had an outsourced development team and they're based in Ukraine. And we were looking through, like, we had a U.S. bank account. Or, like, we were looking through ways to send them money. And the cheapest way for us and them was to just send them ETH at the time. And, like, that was a while ago. Like, we've, we've uh, a lot of freelancers that we work with, we just pay them in, like, a USD stablecoin. Of course. And so, uh, but then they faced the question of, like, okay, well, now I need to turn this into, like, my local fiat currency so I actually use it for something. And so I think that... Um, like for example, in like uh, like in Japan or uh, China is another great example. Like if you want to convert uh, like USDC into CNY, it's not that hard, you know. Um, it's like you the spread is quite tight. You know, like you're not going to pay a lot for that that transaction. Uh, when I was living in Fiji, uh, if you wanted to convert Bitcoin into like Fijian dollar, like that was expensive because there's not a lot of people using crypto in Fiji. Of course. And so I think, so if, I think if you are in, if you are a small business owner and you are in a region, which is like not the United States uh, or not Europe and, um, and, but it's also a region that's large enough to have like a fairly built up kind of internet industry and like a certain, like a certain level of crypto sophistication, like, you know, like Turkey is another great example. Um, then. I think crypto is a really good opportunity for you if you're doing any kind of overseas business because yeah you know like you, you don't have to deal with like wires you don't have to deal with like international banking you just get your money so and then like it's fairly easy to convert that into, into fiat or you can use it for something else right mm -hmm. and so yeah i think it allows these companies to serve like a larger customer segment and go out there especially like IT, like IT outsourcing is a really big winner here, right? Because you can just work anywhere and output, your output can be used anywhere. And um, so yeah, I think so long as you have access to like local fiat liquidity, um, and I think that tools that allow people to get this kind of access easily and integrate it into their system, kind of like, you know, like, um, like what Square did, right? Because all they did like was, you know, they made it easy to use like card payments or to like to get access to like electronic payments. I think that same opportunity and dynamic is still there in crypto. And um, yeah, just waiting for people to go out there and, and uh, serve that market segment. 
That's quite interesting. So this is really w w the conclusion we came to as well, uh, you know, um, at Moon when we talked about the Web3 Enabler project, because same thing, people working in the US zone or in the Euro, Euro zone will probably not have that kind of trouble. But uh, people in Venezuela um, 10 years ago started using Bitcoin to pay for their medications. And, uh, and many countries are facing a banking nightmare and bureaucratic nightmare. So using stable coins is really useful to them, of course. And in this regard, um, do you think that this will, uh, will go on as a trend? Because there's obviously here a winner takes all pattern. They're, they're obviously the, the biggest, uh, the, the stable coins that are pegged to the biggest currency emitters, such as the US or the EU or other huge entities, maybe the Chinese yuan, even though the, um, the stable coins there are, seem, seem a bit different in terms of, of technicality. But uh, do you think that trend will go on or will there be a technical or philosophical or market solution that will allow people to use other types of currencies? not only those pegged to the, the, the three, four huge empires in the world? Um, well, it's kind of a complicated question, but I know, you know, in my opinion, just to kind of like cut to what I think is the root of the question, in my opinion, the dominance of the US dollar is going to continue, but it may not be the dominance of the Federal Reserve issued US dollar. So like even in our trading, most of our order volume comes from USD stable coins. So another, another great example is when the Roman Empire fell, when the Western Roman Empire fell, people still use its currency for hundreds of years. And yeah, you're right. So, you know, right? So yeah, I think like, like the dollar is the amazing product, if you think about it. It's like it's accepted almost everywhere. You know, it's very stable. So uh, and like, especially with like, U like USD stable coins, it's like highly portable, you know, like very easy to transfer. So if you just think about money as a product, then yeah, the dollar is like, uh, like everyone likes dollars, you know, like, can you really say that about like, definitely not CNY, even euros or pounds. There are certain areas where like, I'm going to give you a euro, give you a dollar. I'm going to take the dollar, you know, like I know what a dollar does. And um, let's face it. We, we don't have a huge culture of stable coins in the European un Union at the moment. I mean, even those who are well versed in the, in the crypto products are using USDT, USDC and other US stable coins and less euro, at least in my experience. So yeah, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, um, uh, it's I mean, it's a network effect, right? Because, because everyone likes dollars, more people like dollars and becomes like a positive cycle that kind of locks in the dominance of the dollar. Like even though the Fed has been taking some questionable actions since, since 2008, and like there's been a like through QE, like quantitative easing, there's been a massive amount of dollars that's been printed and um, et cetera. But like dollar dominance has actually increased over that time. Like if you look at COVID, um, like, you know, like DXY, right, the dollar index has actually gone up significantly since COVID started, even though the Fed has been printing a massive amount of money. And even though inflation is a much bigger issue for Americans than it was for decades. And even part of the reason is because like, well, inflation is bad for the dollar, but it's much worse for everyone else. Like if you look at like, uh, like dollar, like per capita inflation, like um, excluding uh, JPY, which is kind of unique, like pretty much everyone has print, been printing more percentage wise than the US dollar. And so, yeah, like even if you look at the fundamentals, it's actually in like a, like a significantly better spot. And that's like, even that's excluding the fact that so many people are buying treasuries, which are more attractive now because the yields are higher. And it's just soaking up like a massive amount of the excess liquidity that's being dumped onto the market. And so, and that's like also excluding the fact that if you like leaving the financial matters aside, the United States is in a really, uh, I think a really strong position for the future because like number one, I mean, obviously it has a strong military, it can defend itself. Uh, it's it can defend its own shipping because it has the world's largest navy. It has like an integrated supply chain because it can just trade with Mexico and Canada and the rest of Latin America. And, you know, it's a net exporter of oil. It's an ex exporter of food. Um, it has a grow like a faster growing population than China or Korea or the EU. Um, it has a lot of arable land. It has a lot of open space, etc. Like the United States is actually, in my opinion, from a geopolitical standpoint, in a really strong strategic position. And so if you think about fiat currency, which is backed by full faith and credit, 
of uh, you know the federal government, well, it's it's like it's a government that's probably going to exist for some time longer. Um, like the one black dark horse being the fact that America is incredibly divided right now. So you never know where, where that's gonna that's gonna go. But um, no, I think uh, I think USC dominance is probably going to continue for you know the next 20, 30 years. Like you don't really see that trend petering out anytime soon. Hmm. And since we're talking about huge empires and huge blocks and you know movements of power, um, another quite interesting empire rising is the um, the alliance between China and Russia. So it's not really an alliance um, on the military front, but it's an alliance in terms of payment because uh, due to the war. Um, Uh, in, uh, in the area between Russia and Ukraine, uh, many sanctions led you, uh, you know led Russia to be cut off from uh, quite many facilities and notably the SWIFT network. So Russia now came to uh, you know ask China for a new solution. So basically, this reinforced the power of China. Um, but China is not really into exporting its Chinese yuan, or is it? That's my question. Um, is it? Do you think it could also uh, put the huge China Pay and Chinese and uh, Chinese Yuan and Russian rub uh, ruble um, together as a huge consortium and as a new reference? Maybe not as big as the USD for the first decades, but do you think that that has this potential? Or do you think um, this is just a convenient alliance financial, uh, financially between China and Russia? And do you think that? Well, after all, this is no, they don't have an expansionist view uh, on the monetary field. How, what's your your take on that? Yeah, well, it's a really interesting phenomenon. You know, it's not just um, it's not just China. Uh, like India is also purchasing Russian oil using INR. Ah. So a bunch of these guys have Russia over the barrel, and um, I mean, like, I don't want to say it's like pointless, but I like I think. The problem the Russians are going to run into pretty soon is they're accumulating all this INR and all this CNY. Well, what are you going to do with all this INR and CNY? You know, like, well, basically you can use it because they can't sell it for dollars because they're locked out of the banking system. So all they can do with it, like, they, basically the Russians have all this CNY and all they can do with it is buy stuff from China. So it just goes right back to China. And so it's just kind of this, like bilateral kind of relationship. And I mean, it's not like China's not going to take uh, INR, right? So They have like this bilateral relationships with other countries that are, and so you can't really create like a free trade, like a, or a free market. And so if you kind of like, like so the CNY goes to Russia, but it comes right back. And so really, all Russia is doing is because you know, like China doesn't need anything from Russia besides oil. You know, like it produces everything, uh, and I guess wheat. So really, Russia is just exchanging wheat and oil for other goods from China. So it really looks more like a barter system than like. An actual trading block. Well, I mean, that being said, it, like it's 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 in a way for Russia to kind of like continue to function even under this like very strict sanction regime. So yeah, I think it's really interesting, and I think we kind of have to see like where it turns out. But there's also like you know there are pretty significant limitations on both sides of the equation that uh, that are also pretty significant. And then again, considering the huge size of both China and Russia, the, those territories have the potential to be self-sustained for quite a long time. So even that closed ecosystem would be interesting as well. Uh, well, uh, actually, I kind of disagree with that because, oh. like Russia, Russia does have a history of autarky, um, and it produces its net. I mean, its net exporter of oil and net exporter of food. Um, but China imports like 30% percent of its food. And wow. it imports like 80% of its oil or 90% of its oil. So it's like it's massively, massively reliant on other countries and the, the kind of the, the free trade kind of paradigm that we've built after, you know, after the WTO. And so, yeah, like in a case of like, for example, if China actually invaded Taiwan, then, well, the next step would be cut to cut off its oil supply and cut off its net food supply. And so it's really not in like, you know, and that's leaving aside the fact that like even the, the food that it does produce is reliant on importing fertilizer from around the world. And you know, China is actually, because they've done such a poor job for environmental protection, they've actually destroyed massive amounts of their own arable land, either via pollution or just like turning it or urbanification. And so 
China is not really in a terribly self-sustainable situation right now. And may, it may never be, you know, or certainly not with the population that it currently has. And then leaving all that aside, so China, like China and Russia have basically always been at war, like accepting very brief periods of peace. Like even when they were allies during the, like during the Soviet years, they were only allies for like 10 years. And then that relationship soured very quickly. So there's not really like, there's not really like a ton of uh, historical friendship between the Chinese and Russian people. And so, yeah, so they're in a, like an alliance right now and it's, it's kind of working for them. It's probably working for China a lot more than it is for Russia because they're basically getting cheap oil. But um, yeah, you know, I think if you really play it out, it's like it's it's based on kind of a an unstable foundation. I'll put it that way. Okay, so in your opinion, this doesn't well th th that doesn't give this small monetary alliance and payment alliance enough leverage to be a valid competitor against the uh, the U.S. Uh, dollar ecosystem, right? Well, yes and no. Like you can you can be like a small competitor, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that, and it certainly is. Like it's a way for Russia to circumvent uh, sanctions, so it certainly is a competitor. Uh, I think whether it's a, st a sustainable competitor, I think is uh, is like up for debate. Okay, so the, the future will tell us if we see more p more people from South America or Africa or uh, a few places in Asia uh, align with uh, with this new alliance instead of. Uh, of the USD, and we'll see that. Okay, that's quite interesting. I love it because it, every time you're you're basically adding very precise information, and I, I love that because that I learned a lot of stuff. And do you think uh, that in the long run it's going to be harder or easier for those those blocks to communicate with each other? Because here, for example, I have a few friends in Russia. Who are you know who who live there, uh, and they were conducting businesses with other countries, and their accounts were frozen in other countries. So now they just rely on their Russian business, uh, local Russian businesses. Uh, maybe this will change. Maybe we'll be we'll revert back to normal. I don't know. But in the meantime, do you think it's um, it's a possibility to have? Two very separate blocks where you basically have BRICS countries and um, NATO countries on uh, on the other hand, and those two have a hard time communicating. Or do you think that that type of cold uh, financial cold war is uh, is not possible nowadays? Uh, well, like, I mean, it's basically a, tr a question about trade, mm -hmm. like global trade, and um, which like. You really have to look at it from the perspective of indiv individual countries. There's not really a way to give like a like a general answer, but if you just look at it from the perspective of BRICS, uh, and like, well, okay, we can look at it from perspective of BRICS and, and NATO, but uh, like BRICS is not really like a formal alliance. You know, like BRICS was. I don't know if you noticed, but BRICS was actually a financial buzzword coined by Goldman Sachs. Like it was just name of some kind of ETF they were they were pushing. And uh, like, true, what is true. that like? Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, right? Mm. And so these countries are incredibly geographically located. Like they're way all around the world. And so if you, if Brazil wants to trade with China, like that's basically going around the world in terms of shipping, and also in a different hemisphere. And so, so like a massive issue right now. Uh, like number one, you had COVID, which you know wreaked havoc on global shipping in general. But then you also have stuff like, you know, the Houthis in Yemen and the pirates in Somalia. So uh, there's more and more uh, pressure and more and more risk involved with global shipping as it is. And so, you know, what you can do if that shipping is important to you, then you can just go out and combat piracy or you can go out and try to fight the, the Houthis, which is what, you know, the United States and what NATO is essentially doing right now because they have the Navy to go out there and protect their own shipping. Now, Brazil doesn't have a blue water Navy and China also does not really have a blue water Navy. Mm. And so their ability to defend their own shipping is going to be quite limited. Um, that's leaving aside, like if they ever came into conflict with NATO or I guess uh, is VCATO, not NATO. Um, I mean, the United States has, you know, by far the world's largest Navy and Japan has probably the world's second most powerful Navy and they're right there on China's doorstep. So, you have to get past them to even start to protect your own shipping. So 
you know, that's a pretty big issue. Um, and that's on top of the fact that the BRICS countries, they don't share any cultural ties. You know, they don't really share any ties, you know, like they kind of come together and have a forum every, every year. And that's basically the extent of like the, their collaboration as a block. Now, NATO is, is very, is like after the invasion of Ukraine is incredibly cohesive as a military alliance. Um, but it's not, it's not a trading block either, you know, like Europe primarily is an exporter, but a lot of trade happens inside Europe. Um, and actually a lot of the export goes to China. So I think like another, a better example, if we're going to look at like kind of the future of global trade is actually NAFTA. So that's like United States, Mexico, uh, Canada, and like kind of the rest of LATAM. And so that's one where it's like, it's a very different situation. Like it's very easy for the United States to protect like not Mexico or Canada, but for the United States to protect its own shipping from Canada and to Mexico if it wanted to. Um, because like not only has Navy, but also has the Coast Guard. Um, on top of that, you have ground communication. So you're going to build a pipeline or build a railway from Canada to the United States. So you don't even need to go like you know, by sea. Um, and like you have cheap labor in Mexico, you have like technical sophistication in Canada. And so there's like a very natural arbitrage that's going on between these countries. Um, you know, plus they've, you know, I mean, the United States and Mexico has kind of a contentious history, but uh, even though it's kind of warmed up over the past 50 or so, or so years, it has, but the U.S. has a very close relationship with Canada. And so these are all kind of like naturally aligned and have a history of being naturally aligned. Like on the flip side, you know, like so let's say shipping is disrupted out of China. Well, you could try to communicate over land, but like if you try to like, for example, like there's no pipeline connecting uh, Siberia with China. So they need to build a pipeline from the oil fields in Siberia all the way through all this like frozen wasteland into China. And that's going to be a pretty significant project. And it also means it's going to be very difficult to ship like wheat, right? Because you need railways. So you need to build that as well. Um, and, you know, on the flip side, right? So all the, all of the oil that goes to get shipped to China, like the majority comes from the, like the Middle East. So it has to go through, you know, India, the Philippines, Taiwan, like it has to go through all these countries that are not terribly friendly with China to get to, to, to China. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to build a land road through Pakistan, which is friendly to China. And the problem is like the Taliban in Pakistan, the TDP, is actually trying to extort the Chinese government. They're saying, we will let you build this pipeline if you pay us 5%. Otherwise, we'll bomb the shit out of it. And so <laughs> like, what are, you, are they going to... Is the is the PLA the People's Liberation Liberation Army? Are they going to post an expeditionary force to fight the Taliban? No, because that would be kind of interesting, right? Yeah. So, but, but, yeah, so there's like they don't have the means to do that. They absolutely don't. You know, like they like the PLA hasn't been in a real war for like forty years. You know, so it's it's very challenging. I think for China specifically, I think it's much more challenging for them to protect their own trade than it is for the mm. United States. Fascinating. Thank you so much. I thought we would get technical and instead we wandered in the world, the subtle world of geopolitics and I loved every second of it. Thank you so much. Do you have any last word to finish this interview? Um, well, you know, I would just say one thing which is unrelated to everything we talked about up to now. Please. Uh, but it's because of our, our message, our conversation on LinkedIn, right? which was, you know, we might talk about the interplay between AI and blockchain. Indeed. So, so I was thinking about that all week, you know, and we had to talk about geopolitics. But I just want to say my spiel, and then we just cut out just because I thought about it for so long, oh, please which do. is that, like, you know, like I told you on LinkedIn, in my opinion, there is no interplay between AI and blockchain. And, like, to me, it's like trying to compare, like, American football and MySQL. You know, like, one's, <laughs> like there's not really a relationship. between. Like, maybe there are some football teams that use MySQL. That's kind of the extent of the collaboration between the two. You know, like to me, AI is the combination of math and philosophy. So it's you know it's very highly specialized. It's it's very research driven. And blockchain is it's an engineering uh, solution more than anything. It's a very kind of um, it's very clever engineering like solution, like blockchain networks. But that's really all it is. And And I think by far the like, um, you know, the most important application has just been put like crypto assets, and then everything uh, like built on top of it has just been like moving crypto assets around. So it hasn't really proven itself to be used for any kind of general computing. Um, 
so yeah, I think uh, I think it's really hard. I don't really think there is much interplay. I think people are just saying that because like they think they're trying to pitch to venture capitalists and they say, well, I'll put one buzzword plus the other and therefore I got twice the money or whatever. You know, but I don't really think it works that way. Yeah, toss in some nanotech as well and toss in some <laughs> ge ge genetics engineering, whatever, and th that's going to be the ultimate unicorn. But I, I love it. Yes, indeed, we had that conversation on LinkedIn and I, and uh, thank you for bring, bringing that up before, before we finish because, yes, indeed, I, I, I'm amazed about that because you've been spending this whole interview basically uh, crushing preconceived ideas and that's why I love this interview and this is uh, a great, uh, great last topic because I think three weeks ago, something like that, we, re uh, you know, LinkedIn and uh, blogs were spammed by uh, a copy paste of uh, the letter of um, of Vitalik from uh, from you know the uh, the Ethereum Foundation, the you know the one of the founders of uh, Ethereum, the the most prominent one, Vitalik Buterin, and it was funny because basically we we. Uh, we all heard uh, we all heard him say, "Oh, here's how AI could help the blockchain industry, and vice versa." And indeed, there are many many people who just say that, and I'm very happy to hear some people to say, "Oh, well, you know, I have a different advice and and a, and a rational one at that." So, thank you so much for that. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for uh, having me on. Thanks so much, everyone. This was Mutual Knowledge. Our guest today was Mao Mohu, and he's working at. Zero Cap, look them up. And of course, like, share, and subscribe. Follow us on YouTube, Twitter. Oh, sorry, now we say X and LinkedIn and all these other channels. Thank you so much, Mamal. All right, thanks so much.